So I did a thing uh, that felt kind of, kind of like Jimmy would have done it, mm-hmm. but not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. You know how we all get emails all the time about 3D mm-hmm. printers? Like some companies like, hey, we have a, the newest, best 3D printer. We are the biggest 3D printer company in the world, and we want to send mm-hmm. you one. Yeah. We get that kind of a thing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. So I I got this email. Most of them I throw away. It came from Elegoo, which is a company that we've gotten stuff from before, and they make good printers and make all sorts of stuff. And <clears throat> they wanted to send me this printer. And I said yes, which I never do. But the reason I said yes is because it is, it is the biggest printer I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. Like, Ooh. so big that I can get inside of it. Now, the problem with it's called the Orange Storm Giga. Hmm. And this was a mo- two months ago or so that they sent me this email. And at the time, I'm like... I have I don't know where I'm going to put that, but yeah, that sounds awesome. Like I'm gonna, not going to turn down a gigantic printer that I could print who, anything I want on or whatever. Well, it shows up tomorrow, and I have no idea where I'm going to put it. I literally hmm. have no space in my house. It's like the size of a refrigerator? No, it's like I should have looked up the more dimensions. More skinnier, more skinnier and taller. No, no, no. It's like a big cube. Um, mm-hmm. Orange Storm, let me give you... It's going to be in metric, so I'm going to have to... Is it resin or is it a... a no, it's FDM, and it is... The bed on it, just the bed, is 800 by 800 by 1,000 millimeters tall. So... <clears throat> so that means it's like the size of like a milk carton? It's like the... <laughs> almost the size of my CNC. It is... It is so big, and so it's like it's like me, it's like it's like three feet by three feet by three feet. Sure, I don't know. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's a me- the, it's like I didn't a me- do the conversion, but no, it's like a meter by a meter by a meter, give or yeah. take. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And I'm excited about it because it is really it's it looks like a good printer. It's cool. It'd be awesome to have something that big. But they sent me the video for assembling it today this morning, and I kind of like skimmed through it. And it is so big. I have no idea where I'm going to put it. And I realized when I was watching these guys put it together that you can't get it out of a doorway. No. So yeah, wherever I put it together, that's where it's going to live forever. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? Don't you have like a garage passage in your, your house? Or is it a garage being used? I, well, yeah. I mean, I could get it through there. Um, yeah. But that would mean that it would have to go in the shop. That's what I'm saying. And like, you leave it in the spot where you can get it at least out of the house. Well, yeah, but then passes. a giant 3D printer in a w- dusty wood shop is not a great idea. So I may have to build yeah. an enclosure to put it in or mm-hmm. something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I may just put it at the office for now, and then <clears throat> I kind of hate potential video tools idea there because do it. Potential video idea: turning a 3D printer into a ping pong table. <laughs> like it hmm. folds open. Yeah, yeah it folds out. Three D printed <laughs> ping pong table. Yeah. So I don't know. I felt a little bit like Jimmy going, Oh look, a new cast iron right. giant hunk of tool. I'm gonna get that. Yes, I'll take that. Thank you. Um, now d- does that something like that have big giant filament rolls? Is that like an option? Uh you can. You can add like a five kilo kilowatt <laughs> kilogram. <laughs> kilowatt. <laughs> uh, you can add a giant five kilogram spool to it um normally they're one kilogram Mm. but yeah i think you'd have to because it's if you were to print something that big it would use so much filament Mm. i don't know i don't know what i'm gonna do with it and i know people are screaming you can give it to me (laughs) and i might have to do that at some point but i don't know where i'm gonna put it just to even be able to use it you know i did Mm. not think this all the way through so I guess that's the part that felt like Jimmy. I didn't think this all the way through. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Why well, think? Just slows everything down. Yeah. Mm. Hashtag. I am excited about problems. it though. I mean, it's it's cool, you know. And I'm I'm interested to see what it can do. But I'm interested to see what you do with it. Yeah. Like what you make. I don't have it. a great idea. I probably should have come up with a great idea before I said yes. But we'll see. Picturing like a big. Big human skull is like a table base. There you go. 
Well, another interesting thing about it, though, and I saw this somewhere. I don't see them talking about it now, but it has one print head over this giant volume. But they also had a, an example of it having four, because it's basically four big printers attached. So the, the print bed is basically four big print beds. And they had an attachment or a setup where you could have four different heads doing the exact same thing at the same time. So they were kind of moving like this, you know, like all. So you could print four of something mm. at the same time, not one then the other, actually doing four prints. And so for production, you know, if you're producing parts or something, you've got four pretty big volumes already. Uh, and so that would make production a lot faster, assuming they all worked well. So that's an idea. But I still don't really know what that thing would be yet. So, oh yeah, I see the photo with the four print heads. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool idea. So I don't know. We'll see. I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. It'll be here in a couple of days, and I'm going to figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I think the frustrating thing, frustrating because I didn't think through it all the way, is that I can't get it here and then put it together to check it out and then be like, okay, well now it has to go here. Right, you got to decide. I have to that decide thing. where it's going, but so I put it together in a doorway that it can fit through. So, but <clears throat> boo hoo, right? <laughs> right, boo hoo poor, me. <laughs> poor Bob. Oh, I know. We're gonna start a Kickstarter for you. Yeah, I need to go fund me for my help you white doors. doors. <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys up to? What are you guys been doing? Skateboards. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. oh yeah. I How's got uh, I got one of ten done, and uh, it's been. So the, the vi like the first part of the video, I think, is going to be about why you need a vacuum press and why it's cheaper than you think. So we went to uh, Joanne Fabrics and we got vinyl. I got two yards of vinyl for $7 because they always have like a crazy like 50% off coupon. And then some ceiling tape and, and just the, the, uh, the, the wine savers. Like I just ordered a $10 wine saver, which is like a little rubber nibble with a, with a hand pump. And we made vacuum bags out of that and it worked perfectly fine. Really? Wow. And so I'm thinking the video is like a three level, three different levels of a vacuum pressing where you make your own for less than 20 bucks. And then we went to Harbor Freight and we got their cheapest vacuum pump for $99. That also worked great. Um, plus you get a little bit more, more of a vacuum with that. And you, with, with the little hand pump, you got to come back every couple minutes and make sure like air is still, still pulling out. And then like the third level is like my crazy vacuum pump system where the thing is like a thousand bucks. Then we make 10 skateboards with it. And so skateboard one of 10 is done. And that one was satisfying, and I'm not as excited about the other nine <laughs> as I oh. was when I first started. But uh, I'm just gonna, I think I'm just gonna make two a day and just get it over with. Do you, do you think you're gonna run out of steam before you get to the end and change your goal? Since I talked about making 10 throughout the video, I, I, I think I'm, Got it. I've committed <laughs> and, and I think that's on purpose. So, and it's just going to be, I think it'd just be more impressive that, and they're all 10 different designs and they have somewhat of a common theme, just kind of like abstract graphic design. And I'm, I'm happy with all my designs. So I want to, I want to see this through. There's a chance like a couple of them, maybe don't come out of the vacuum press perfect and maybe we have less than 10 but the goal is 10. How cool. are you applying the are you applying a graphic or, or a wooden pattern? How are uh, you doing like a marquetry veneer laser oh, cut. Oh right on. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And that's on the on the the foot side or the belly side? The the belly side. So it would hang mm -hmm. on the wall belly side out. Right. And then the other mm -hmm. side, belly side. The, where, where there would be grip tape. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm not grip taping them. Mm -hmm. Because the, the point is to just have them hang on the wall. I did get enough veneers or enough layers. You can buy uh, uh, you can buy just pre-made ready skateboard maple layers. And they have two nice outside layers. And then the, um, the five inside layers, two of them have the grain going the opposite way to, to build strength. 
And so I, I bought enough to do 11 skateboards in case I screw up one. And if I do get 11, I'm going to try to find a local skateboarder to do to like mess it up, try to grind on it. And so I have this beautiful marquetry skateboard just grinding on a rail and we'll, we'll see. All my friends are in their late 40s and they still skateboard, <laughs> but I don't know that they have the ability to do tricks anymore. So maybe their maybe their kids can. I got to find somebody you know, locally. You just made me think of something interesting. If you took a cool graphic and then pretended like it was ground, and then mm. put the grind lines in it and do the whole marquetry as if they like a, <coughs> something real beautiful and then then intentionally put the grind graphic in it yeah. as if it was ground, you know? But then it never was ground, but then when you get close, it's like part of the Ooh, I like complex that. artistry. It's, I, got a, uh, I got a lot of ideas. You can just guess. What you, what you mentioned earlier, and the, the skull table where the base of the table is the skull, mm -hmm. and then there's, um, I pictured like, so that it has a round top, but that round top is not at the top of the skull. It's a little bit lower, so a portion oh, yeah. of the skull sticks up, and then you could open it up, and it could be like an ice chest in there. <laughs> yeah, Whoa. <fruit> basket. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. You'd have to drain like, the skull at the end of the night. Uh, that'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> It's like Faces of Death when, remember the movie Faces of Death? They had like mm. a monkey sticking through the table like that. Anyway. Mm. <laughs> Gross. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I never watched as a kid. Uh, oh, um, remember, so there were, with the, there's the spinoff Traces of Death. Do you remember that too? No. Oh, I God. I, please, people don't look this stuff up. It's not, it's not worth your time. Faces of Death was this like movie made by some independent movie maker. I, I heard an NPR story on it. And if my memory <laughs> serves... Most of it was faked. A lot of it was faked. Oh, yeah. And uh, it became this viral movie before viral before the internet. It was like a viral movie. Like the, there was bootleg VHS tapes being handed around. Yeah, it was really a, faces of death. If you're too young, look it up. It's, it's, it was a phenomenal. If you're too young, look it up. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like the, the concept of it. It's just, it's like all the way people die in all different cultures and what what they do with them. That's really what the movie was about. And some of them were gory, and some of them. But apparently, a lot of it was just faked and made up. Well, hmm. faked. I don't know if the, the facts might have been true, but the what you were looking at was faked. Anyway. I have a question about the marquetry. <laughs> so are you yeah. are you are you doing that work to it before the press? Yes. Or are you doing yeah. that after you press? No, all uh, before it's pressed. So there's uh, the skateboards that I'm making have seven layers, and I'm adding eighth layer, an eighth layer of veneered marquetry on top of that. So that all goes oh. into the press, and I was worried that how the marquetry would do over over the compound bends, and it came out just fine. Wow, I did get hmm. some glue squeeze out. Like uh, the vacuum press would suck up some of the glue. I even used veneer glue, which is supposed to reduce that glue coming out through the pores. But so I've got some cleanup to do. But yeah, uh, and I haven't sanded it or, or finished it yet. But I think it's all going to work. Wow, that's awesome! I can't wait to see that. Cool, cool. Jimmy, what about you? What have you been doing? Making uh, chain. I know you've been doing. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say I've been all excited about this. That this jig chain. looks awesome. We've been talking about. Well, I've been talking about making a chain for a little bit. I don't know if we talked about it here on this episode on this this podcast, but it's something that's been in my notes for a long time, like a couple of years, and that's why the first post when I made my first two links, I was so excited. It's like, do you ever think about something for so long? And then when you finally do it, you're like, why did I think about this for so long? I should have done it. I guess the biggest reason. When I started analyzing that in my own brain, I started thinking the biggest reason was I'm going to make a chain, but why? And and I looked in my notes and I started, I wrote in my notes, I don't have my notebook right here, but I basically wrote to myself, sometimes the, it's, it's the process that's more, obviously people say the journey is really the fun part versus getting there. And in this case, that applies. It's more about the learning of making a chain than actually making a chain. So all the steps in that go into learning the process or figuring it out or MacGyvering my way through making a chain. And it's been it's been amazing. It's just two days. I'm basically done. The videos I'm like ninety percent done because I've been taking breaks and editing in between. But last night was pretty labor intensive. I got the chain down to it was at like ten feet. 
and I wanted to use it to cover my driveway so I can put it on. I have pillars at my driveway, so I was going to chain it to the pillars, and so I can make. I have a gate at one side that I made in a YouTube video, and then at the other side, I was going to just put the chain up, just really more cosmetic. I, I'll never put the chain up because then I'll never get my packages, but. I wanted to make it at least 12 feet long. So last night I was like, I, I said, I got the whole process down. Let me just go forth and make the next three feet. So I cut a bunch of pieces and that was the last uh, Instagram post I posted where I was making them really quickly. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a cool video because I've talked about doing this in the past, how in these next few videos I'm going to make, I'm going to stop, do in the moment camera conversations where I'm thinking, what I'm thinking, versus me doing all that behind the camera and just running through it quickly, and then it looks like I magically knew what I was doing. This case, I'm going to work through and figure it out, and so that's what I was doing. It's funny, because I went for a walk at the farmhouse down the block, the graveyard house. There's a big barn there that I hardly ever go in, and I think to myself, let me go look in the barn, see if there's anything I could find that would trigger some concepts about this chain. And there's this whole tangled up mess of rebar in there, and I was like, wait a minute. I was stuck on something. I was stuck on what can I make into a bar that I could then make into a chain. So for me, the whole process was taking like a wagon wheel. That was my original idea, like the strapping on an old wagon wheel because upstate they're everywhere. And taking an old strapping from an old wagon wheel, putting that through the hydraulic press and making that really skinny and then turning that into a chain. And so I was kind of caught up on that first process. But then I found all this rebar tangled up in the barn. And I thought, I could just start right here. And then I'm only worried about how to bend it versus the whole process of turning it into uh, turning it into a, a rod. So I was like, all right, let me just start here. And, and it's, been a, it's, it's been a process. Just figuring out the bending jig is like the predominance of the video. So it's been it's been really fun. And now I have a, about a 15-foot chain that I could use to keep the UPS drivers from coming up the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just use that. I'll just use that for a, a beauty shot. And then the chain will just sit in the grass for the next 30 years. Uh, <laughs> that's, like, that's a plan. <laughs> yeah, no, I gotta, I, I'll do it just cosmetically. Th 30 years from now, you'll be out walking in the yard like, what can I use to make this thing? And then you'll come across the chain. <laughs> <laughs> right. Part two. But I, the, the important takeaway for me is that when you're kind of stuck on something, when we get, we all get stuck on something, I went for, I was like, let me go over to the barn that I never go to and look around. Because this still this barn is fairly large and there's lots of nooks and crannies that I don't that I don't have committed to memory, so I was just walking around in there and just looking at things. It's like you know, I got to do that more often. Just go even if it's you know not something that I possess. Just walk anywhere and just look at stuff. There's a Coxsackie Antique Center up here, and I often go there when I'm looking to try and have some small breakthroughs. Just walk around the Antique Center. Me and Jocko mm -hmm. went there, and I'm, I'm working on a vlog for Patreon, and me and Jocko were walking around the. Kaksaki Antique Center. He really had fun there too. That's cool. I have yeah. a lot of things like that. I think we've talked about it before, but <clears throat> where you get stuck on one idea or one, like the solution is this, and that solution, it you know, it may need these things, or it needs this amount of time, or it needs this amount of. It's waiting on this, and so I'll put these connections or these mental blocks attached to that solution. And if those blocks are in the way, then that solution can't happen, which means it's like an open-ended problem in my head. And um, so, <laughs> oddly enough, there's been a there's a bunch of stuff in my shop that needs to be thrown in the dumpster. The dumpster's at the office, and it's big stuff. It needs to go on the trailer. And I had never pulled my small little, you know, simple to pull trailer with my green Land Cruiser because I just didn't, I haven't trusted the vehicle enough to like, you know, can, can I reliably pull a trailer with a manual transmission? I've never done that before. I don't know if it's a big deal or not. I have no idea. Never done it. You know, so there are all these little things like, I don't know if I should try, I should just wait till I get my other cruiser back. And that's been my thing for like 18 months now. I should just wait till I get the other one back. I should get... <laughs> And so the other day I was like, all right, I just got to 
get over this and try it. And it was so weird. It was exactly what you're saying. It was so weird. I put the trailer on there. I backed out of the driveway and I'm like, oh, I can't even feel that the trailer is there. Why was mm. this an issue in my mm -hmm. head at all? Drove it to the store, picked up supplies, came back here, and I'm like, well, I guess I should probably just throw the stuff on that I've been putting off for 18 months and get rid of it. And it's funny because as I was thinking about that and kind of like getting on my own case or why did I make that into a big deal? I realized that it was just an unknown. And the yep. worst that could have happened was... 18 months ago, I just put it on the truck and went, oh, this is hard. I can't do this or it won't work or whatever. If there was some bad thing that came out of that or it didn't work like I wanted it to, I would have known mm -hmm. that 18 months ago and then that would have been it. Right, yeah. But instead, I like, I've held this mental weight and physical space because I need to throw things away and throwing those things away was all downstream of me just trying to put the trailer on the truck. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, why, why did I do that? What a waste. So, yeah, I'm with you. I need to do better at that. Sometimes you got to just, just not think. But there's a difference between thinking and marinating on an idea. It's kind of, we might talk about that today. There's, there's a big difference between not doing something because there's a glitch of fear that we haven't identified versus I'm not sure I'm ready yet. And, and with the chain, the big problem was like, why was I going to make it? I had faith I could figure it out, but the whole reason was like, why am I going to make it? What is the point of making it? And then when I got over, just make it to make it. There's no big deal. It doesn't have to be used as some big ta-da. Right. And that's when I got past that. I, I mostly do that when I get, <clears throat> when I'm, when I have a problem or a thing that needs to happen that is reliant on something else, that's reliant on something else, that's reliant on and I have this chain. And I was telling somebody in our Patreon hangout last night for I Like to Make Stuff about this, and he said, that sounds like classic ADHD if those things were not attached to each other. You know, if it was like, I'm distracted by this thing because I have to do this, because I have to do this, because I have to do this. But what I'm talking about is... My office is a complete wreck, but it's a wreck because the things that are in my office don't have a place to go. They need to go in storage in the shop area, but that's that's full because the stuff needs to be thrown in the dumpster. It's not in the dumpster because the trailer was hard to put on, or I thought it was going to be hard to put on the, you know, it's like that kind of a chain of, of things. And so now that I've kind of unlocked the beginning of the chain, I'm hoping that all of this other stuff will start to shift and this will get accomplished and then that will move and then that will get accomplished and that will move. And so it's, I don't know, like I said, I was a little bit on my own case about it, kind of disappointed in myself because I've been holding this big long chain of events in like in the air when all I had to do was like attack the first thing in the chain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> chain, because <laughs> you're talking yeah. about chain. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. But no. to, to your credit, it is stressful pulling a trailer if it's not something you do every day. Because I, I have a trailer, and every time I have to pull it, I got to like go through all the safety checks in my head and, and think like, okay, make sure I don't do this. I don't want to break something. I don't want to lose the trailer. I don't want to blow a tire. I don't want to this. I don't want to that. And the other day, I was driving out of my driveway about a month ago with my trailer, and it was all the way down in the back, which is this twisty, turny road. And I'm coming up, and I'm just cruising along, and I'm like, okay, that wasn't bad. I got hooked up, and I'm driving. All of a sudden, I came to a complete stop, as if I hit a brick wall. But I didn't hit a brick wall. My wheel well hit a tree on the Ooh. trailer mm -hmm. 20 feet behind me. I made a turn too sharp, and the tree got hooked in front of the wheel well, which sticks out of the trailer. And I was like, oh, that's annoying. So I back, I tried to back up, and it was very difficult to back up. And I said, before I do anything wrong, let me get out and look. And I went out and looked. And the fender was completely embedded in the tire. Not flat, oh. but Ooh. creating a brake situation. So I went and I got an angle grinder. There was this big bracket that was bent that holds the fender in place. I had to cut the bracket and then use a come along and bend the fender out. It was about a 20 wow. minute. It was about a 20 minute diversion, but I got it. And then and I was able to bend the fender to a point where it doesn't look really bad, but I have to weld all my cuts back. I haven't done that yet. Mm. But that's that's why it's stressful with a trailer because you think you know just when you like I got all my safety checks in and then you drive it and you forget you have another thirty feet behind you. My 
my issue, I have an enclosed trailer for the go-kart and my issue is, uh, the space that I take up on the road. So I get on the bypass. I have about one mile to get over three lanes to get off of the exit that I need to. And the anxiety that I, that builds up in me <laughs> I know what you, you want to before be I even to get in the away. truck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. For me, it's always like getting it back on the property because I have two little driveway entrances with tight turns. So I'm like, I don't want to knock over my very expensive pillars. They cost me lots of money. Mm. So every time I drive in the driveway, I'm going like creeping in and everybody behind me is annoyed. I'm like, I'm not knocking my pillars over. You have no idea how much they cost. <laughs> Coming really slow. I And I have, I need to back up my trailer. We have a long driveway. I have to back it up to where where it sits and if i see my neighbors and it's not a straight shot there's a slight little little bend if my neighbors are outside i'll just pull it's, forward it's and like i'll do it tomorrow i'll do it tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> i have the luxury of nobody seeing me try 450 times to go back all the way to the black barn <laughs> and i try like 100 times the very first turn is this tightest one which is the one i hit going out where i caught the tree but it takes me maybe six attempts to get that and if, if okay, it's so like for, if for instance mike the fireman could really always drive a trailer anyway if he happens to be around or derek i go could you just do this for me because <laughs> those guys drive big trucks all the time with trailers on them do you so do you guys when you're backing a trailer up i've heard of a couple different ways to do it some people will put their hands on the bottom of the wheel mm -hmm. and then you turn the way that you actually want to turn yeah that's never worked mm. for me yeah it's kind of crazy but mm. i i prefer to turn around and look at it because that makes sense to my brain is that i cannot be looking at the wheel but i can be looking at the trailer and then i can back it up yeah. that way a little bit better not not great <laughs> which way do you all do that i well <sighs> go ahead david i'll tell you my, my method i'm using my backup camera on the truck um and i gotta i use mine too I got to space my trailer in between the neighbors. Uh, our, we have a long driveway, and the neighbor has a long driveway, and then they kind of meet at our garages. So I have to get mine in between my neighbor's car and the entryway to my to my shop. And so um, there's a big enough space where there's there's room for play. But I'm using I think my hand on top of the wheel, and then looking at my at my camera trying to get it in that space and gotcha. my brain just has a hard time even though i will tell myself you know turn right to go this way my brain just has a hard time comprehending that it's like the smarter everyday reverse bicycle bike yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i i well derek said it to me years ago uh we were fiddling around with the trailer and he said he, he said the way i do it is i put my hand at the bottom of the wheel and move your hand in the direction that you want the tail of the trailer to go i'm gonna try that and and that's basically what you were saying, Bob. But if you think about it the way I just said it, put your hand at the bottom and don't turn left or right. Just think about it. I want the, the tail of the trailer to go to my left. So turn your hand to the left. I want the tail of the trailer to go to the right. This is with your hand at the bottom of the steering wheel. And the way Derek explained it to me that day, that's how I do it now every time. And it works good. I mean, my spatial awareness is bad, so I still have to try five attempts every time. But... It goes in the direction I want. So. If it's not straight, does that annoy you? And will you redo it? Yes. Because I have yeah. to walk past my trailer every <laughs> single day. And if it is not straight, <laughs> I, I can't stand it. Yeah. I, but that being said, one of the a project that I have coming up, and I've been buying all the parts for it. I bought the, the, the ball hitch clip, and I bought wheels. I bought hubs online. I'm making a garden cart for the back of the Polaris. And so I'm still trying. I'm trying to think of that one cool thing because the garden carts are so boring. I'm just trying to think of like one cool attachment. I did buy a ratchet, a uh, crank ratchet to pull things up onto it. So now I'm trying to devise a way to make a cool ramp. So like maybe the the whole entire footprint of the thing has a ramp that flips down for storage, and you can keep it up if it's loaded, and you can flip it all the way down. That's not overly inventive, but just trying to think of. A cool technique that you wouldn't find in your average garden cart for Polaris that you could buy at Northern. You could buy these things at Northern for four or five hundred dollars. Trying to think of a reason why it would be a little bit interesting to make your own. So that's what I'm working through right now. Like a fifty cal turret on the back. That'd be yeah. That's like a good you idea. Didn't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<clears throat> yeah. So yeah, and so that, and then if you guys ever drove a small trailer, this is why it makes me think of it. If you drive a tiny trailer on the back of your truck, I've pulled. A, I have a Polar. What is it called? It's a Lincoln Electric Ranger. It's a generator that's on its own little tiny cart that you hook to your car. And if you have to go backwards with a tiny trailer, it's almost impossible. You'll jackknife oh, yeah. it in like <laughs> two feet. So if you have a big trailer, like I have an 18 foot long car hauler, it's much easier to back up because you could see it. That's one thing. You could see the tail of it versus backing up with this generator. But the other thing is the generator is so small, you could just unhook it and push it around. So when I'm getting somewhere with it and I need to use it, I just unhook it and unhook it off the car and move it around by myself. Hmm. Just to try and back up with it, you just all of a sudden it's underneath the car and you're like, what is that noise? Oh, I forgot I had a trailer on the back of my car. <laughs> so I can't see yeah, it. Yeah, our trailer is, it's a little, I guess it's five by eight. You know, it's, it's a very small trailer. And the ramp that flips down is long enough that when it's up, you can see it in the rear view mirror. So oh, you can't yeah, see yeah. the trailer, but you can see the top corners yeah. of See, that the trailer, it's similar to the trailer that I had to build the, build the kitchen on. The shorter they are, the more difficult they are to back up. Hmm. It's, it's complicated. The backing up in, on this one was not the thing that made me avoid using it, because um, I have used the trailer enough on different vehicles and stuff that I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with trailer, that, that trailer, not big ones. The thing is, like on the Green Cruiser, it's a manual transmission, which I never drove growing up. I taught myself how to drive a manual when I got the Carmagia. I just like, all right, let me think about how ago. this works. I'm going to do it. Cool. I did it. Easy. And so I'm still not terribly used to it, but I, I, I'm getting used to it now that I'm driving the Green Cruiser a lot. And so it's, it's not a huge deal. The problem, though, is that well, two things. One, it's very hilly where I live. I mean, it's probably hilly where you guys That's are, too. always annoying, yeah. So to go to Lowe's or Home Depot, either one, I have to go up and down these big hills. And for some reason, I guess because it's modern times, all of the stoplights in our town are at the top of hills. So I get to <laughs> oh. the top of the hill and I stop, and I'm sitting there, and some person pulls up right behind me. Some kid in their little brand-new car pulls up like, right up against me and i'm like you have no idea if you see something old and this is a lesson i'm going to teach my 100 percent teaching everybody else if you see an old car on a, on the road do not pull up close to that car give them a car <laughs> length and it's for your own best interest that they're not going to yeah. roll back and bump your bumper so nobody does that for me here um, <laughs> i have anxiety respect the just elders, thinking about right? that you know yeah. Oh, so yeah. every oh. single time I take that thing through that area of town where those stores are, which I have to do all the time, I have to stop on a hill and then I have to start right there. So having the trailer on just makes that even more, <laughs> I don't know if it actually changes anything, but it's like now I have something actively pulling me in reverse that I have to work against. Yeah. Mm. Oh. So that's been the big thing. And when I was driving it the other day, I had to go through that section of town to get um, some supplies and it was not an issue at all and that was one of those things it felt like that was going to be a big problem and it was totally fine you, you know? need a bumper sticker that says stay back 10 feet yeah probably should when, when I was a kid I, I the first couple of cars I owned were Volkswagen Bugs and whenever I got to this one spot on the way to high school it was you'd go underneath the railroad track so you'd go under and then it'd be a really steep hill like 20 feet to the red light and everybody would go up to the red light and just be at this huge ramp. I would always just stop at the bottom where the car could just settle and not roll and wait. And they'd be like four car lengths ahead of me to the red light. And people would go bananas. Like the oh, light sure. is red. I'm sitting at the bottom of the hill. I'm not going to go on this 45 degree slope because I'll just never be able to make it without hitting somebody. And people would go crazy. They're like, move up to the red light. <laughs> like, the light is still red. <laughs> you can't go anywhere anyway. <laughs> what difference does it make? And then another time I, I visited my friend in San Francisco and he's like, oh, the, the keys are on the thing. Just take my car. He's like, well, you know, one of these cars that no one cares about that everybody that stays with them uses. I drove the thing like three miles. I parked it and I, I, I said, I sent him a message. I said, the car is parked over here. I said, I am going to kill myself or somebody or destroy this car. Yeah. What a night. It's like a badge of honor in San Francisco if you have a stick shift and you're able to navigate mm. the city without a problem no, that wasn't you. me that was yeah. not me i said i'll walk thanks i said the car's over here i'll see you later <laughs> so in addition to this 
of the Green Cruiser a couple weeks ago, um, the clutch started acting weird, which is an important part of a manual transmission. <laughs> you know, it started feeling different, and it was still working all right, but it it didn't have the same oomph. So I got to looking in it. As I'm, this is this is another one of those. Hey, I like cars now. Here's a new thing that I have to encounter and figure out how to do and fix and you know troubleshoot and stuff. So I go to look at it. The fluid's down. So I add fluid back to the thing, and I'm like, well, the fluid's down because there's a leak somewhere, obviously. So I start looking that up, and uh, I don't know what everybody knows listening. So <clears throat> the, in a clutch, there's a, a master cylinder up at the top that you're controlling with the pedal, which is hydraulically connected to a slave cylinder, which is down by the clutch, and it pushes this plate in and out. And so there's two there's two cylinders with hydraulic lines in between them. So the lower cylinder, the slave cylinder, had a leak in it. And you could see the fluid coming out of this. It was still holding enough fluid to work, but it was leaking. And so I didn't didn't want to get on the road and either have the clutch not engage or not disengage, whatever the situation might be. So I started looking at, well, how do you, how do I replace this? How big of a deal is this? Turns out it's not a big deal at all. It took me I ordered a legit part from Toyota or from the company that makes them from Toyota. Got it in a couple of days. It took me five minutes to get the old one off, five minutes to get the new one on, and I learned how to bleed. I had bled brakes before one time before, but I didn't really remember the specifics. Um, And so I learned how to bleed this just like you bleed brakes, and it took another 10 minutes with Jenny helping me at the pedal. It's good to go done fixed like in no time at all very little effort and so now i can at least trust in like that one part being fixed so that took another thing out of the equation another variable of like i don't know if this thing's gonna work like it's supposed to work you know but it had been a little while since i had repaired anything on a car and I went into it with that same hesitation of like, oh man, how mu- how big of a deal is this going to be? Like, what do I have to learn? What do I, ha- you know? And it was it was so easy, and it was nice to that one. I didn't put off because you know, obviously I needed to drive the car. So I had this happened midweek Saturday. I had some time. I'm like, all right, Saturday I'm doing the clutch. I'm going to figure it out in just a few minutes, and it was done. So that was nice to, and I guess also was another piece of evidence towards just attack the thing. Just mm-hmm. just give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, you'll know that it's not going to work. But if it does work, then it's over with. You know? So I had both of those scenarios this week. And it's working better, which is cool. Nice. I think I it would have what would have stopped me was if I don't get this, then I have to call a, a towing company to, to tow this to somewhere else. And that would have been my barrier. And then I would be out of a vehicle yeah. for so many days. So. Well, and that's why I've I've avoided trying to do anything to the Green Cruiser. Like, I'm not trying to... F- I have a fuel injection system, which I don't know how to put on, but I have it. I have new leaf springs to put on it that I don't know, know how to put on. But I know both of those things will take it out of commission for at least some amount of time because mm-hmm. they're both a lot of work. They're not They're not simple swaps. And so there's been several things like that that I would like to fix, I would like to upgrade, but I don't want to make, I need the car, you know, I don't want to take it out of commission. So there's a few things like that that are waiting until I don't have to rely on it. Until you Um, get your other one back? Yeah, I don't know when that's ever going to happen. No idea. No idea. When it does come back, then this one's just going to start coming apart. Do what? Give the guy the title at this point. (laughs) He wouldn't want it. He'd give it back to me. <laughs> Guarantee it. Yeah. Um, so the, all of that, uh, you know, moving stuff around, trying to clear out space in the shop. <clears throat> I've been working in our basement for the last, I mean, I've been talking about it for a while, several weeks. And now I'm in the final stage of of doing the the actual space. So I'm like, patching walls i had a big area of drywall i had to patch and I'm wrapping ducting and stuff and i'm adding lights and i've got all this stuff planned for the space and so hopefully by the end of this week middle of next week 
the basement will be done. Like the kids part of the basement will be completely done, ready for them to enjoy. <clears throat> and I'm kind of ready to move on because I've done three videos in that space now. And I'm glad to have it done. I'm glad to make it a usable space for them, but I'm kind of ready to do something in the shop and do something else. And so I have a, a storage idea for the shop that I'm working on and I don't really have it yet. So I don't want to talk about it, but it's, it's like big, complex, not complex, big, useful storage, not just like, here's a thing to put a bin, mm. you know? Um, so I'm trying to make this a, a really useful, cool storage thing, which is, well, sounds a little bit ironic because it's storage, but, um, it dawned on me recently that when we moved into this house, my office, this room was the storage room in the house. It was the where all the shelves are and all the boxes for the stuff that you don't use you know, throughout the year. And I turned that into my office. So we don't have a storage room, that like kind of traditional just deep storage thing. And so I'm trying to make a kind of portable solution for that, for the family and for the shop and stuff. So... It's kind of interested to see how it turns out. It's been really cool to see the transformation of your house. I was there before you did all the stuff to the kitchen and this this oh, kids' room right. and and to um, it, I think it's really cool that you've done it all. Like our house has gone through a trans transformation as well, but I didn't do it. We've you know somebody else has been doing it because I'm just not into that stuff. But to see like you'll always have this YouTube channel where you can see the progression of this house, which is really cool. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see down the road when my kids are grown ups, if they are at all interested in looking back at how the house was, mm -hmm. because they'll have a record of, you know, of what it looked like. They, we talked to them recently about Savannah because the, they have been away from Savannah for about seven years now. And they don't, most of them don't remember much about our house there, which is totally fine. Like it doesn't matter, but they, their memories of that place and how it was are pretty thin. But for me, that was really formative. My kids were brand new. You know, I was, I've made this thing my job. So a lot of stuff happened in that house and it is burned into my head about where things were and what we did and, you know, the work that I did in this room and that room and stuff, but they don't. I don't remember at all. But this house, they're going to have videos all about it if they ever cared to look back and see what it looked like when they were, you know, in elementary school or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I've been up to. Uh, we had a question or had a con like a topic from your Discord server, David. Is that right? From I'm going to in your shop um and he go, it goes on but i think i just want to stop the question right there what would be the hardest thing to give up in your shop and mm. so is, is what's the scenario like you have to downsize you need space for something what's the um hmm well let's say let let's say i have a massive giant 3d printer coming in <laughs> And I don't have room for this. So I have to get rid of one tool that takes up a, a, a significant footprint. Okay. What hmm. are you getting rid of? <laughs> I actually went through this exercise. Oddly enough, it's it's almost like you know what's going on. I, I went through this exercise trying to figure out how I could create space for a giant 3D printer recently. And that was a joke because <laughs> I... Anyway, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> for me, I think the first things to go in my shop, if I had to downsize or I was trying to make space for things, the first tools that would go would be my joiner and my drum sander, which are both very useful when you need them. But for me, I need them about 5% of the time. And I That's... think both of those things could be replaced with another tool that I already have in the space. So, you know, those would be the first two to go. I, or to not buy in the first place, yeah. honestly. I, uh, man, I spent two hours on my drum sander yesterday making veneers, trying to match the thickness of other veneers. And it's, 
it, it sounds easy. Yeah, you're just playing it down as thin as you can go, and then you run it through the drum sander. But it's over and over and over again. And uh, I wouldn't. I I I use my drum sander so much that I, I would not want to get rid of it. I think one of the first things that would go is my joiner. That thing I use it all the time, but there are so many other ways to joint an edge or a face mm. of a board, and it takes up so much room. That is the first thing I think would go, even before mm. the lathe, which I only use once a year. I have a twelve oh, yeah. foot lathe, and I use it once every three years. <laughs> but when I have it and I need it, I need it. And the fact that it's so long gives me some other liberal thinking. It's one of those. Hmm. One day I'm going to make porch poles. One day. That's mm-hmm. the whole reason I bought it. Mm. And I bought the porch poles when I restored the porch out here. But maybe for the graveyard house, I'll use it for some porch poles. I could park it outside. That's always a possibility. But if I had to get rid of one thing, I would like to get rid of my scissor lift. I have a scissor lift that's about the size of a Volkswagen Bug, just parked in my shop, so I could change the light bulb once every seven years. That's oh my 20 gosh. feet in the air. <laughs> I, I, the saga of my scissor lift, I rented it when I ver- first got the shop put together, the big one on the TV show, and we got it to do the electric. So I rented it for a month, and then I ended up keeping it for six months, and it cost me like $10,000 for six or eight months. So I'm like, I'm going to keep renting it. Let me just buy one. So then I went and I bought one for $9,000. And so that's my $20,000 scissor lift, where if I thought it through a little bit, but that was right at the beginning of me, like getting used to spending lots of money, getting over, <laughs> getting over the pain. So it was more easy to digest buying the thing one month at a time, thinking, okay, this will be the last month I'll need it, versus coming to terms with the fact that I'll always need one. Hmm to do something mm. in the rafters of this big high giant barn so it's a basically a nine ten thousand dollar ladder that i have to always have at the ready i also always have to make sure it's charged because if i don't charge it the batteries go dead and i have to put new liquid in them or whatever you call that Distilled is there water. i mean what what's the alternative for changing lights like that there's got to be another way scaffolding or yeah but then then you get you got to build it and put it and then move it over and build it and put it move it over this thing has a cantilever so you can go up and then cantilever over a machine to get at the wall hmm. there's a couple of conveniences about it gotcha. but that's that's there's a slippery slope when you have a building that's 20 feet tall actually it's like over 30 feet tall at the tallest interior part for instance, I keep wanting a sawmill, but then I think to myself, if I buy a sawmill, then I have to buy a skid steer. And then if I get a skid steer, I got to buy something with tracks. You know, so all of a sudden I'm $50,000 in. You know, if I wanted like a proper sawmill. So it's the same thing when I built this building. All of a sudden, you know, there's all these things, these costs, you don't realize that you have to pony up. And then the, I know what I would get rid of. It just came to me. I'd get rid of that pool table I made. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Anybody want a pool table? <laughs> oh, I'd like a pool table. It's like right where my truck project was going to go. I th- didn't expect it to live here. Mm. I played pool about 10 minutes after I finished making it. I never played pool again. Now it's a I opened it up. Stuff. It's funny. During Maker Camp, I, I opened it up. I dusted it off because there's always a lot of traffic through here during Maker Camp. I figured there's going to be people drinking and playing pool all night long now wh- everybody like walks up to it, grabs a ball throws it across the table like this is really cool and then they just walk out <laughs> nobody <laughs> cares mm-hmm. makers at least not in this crew <clears throat> have any interest in playing pool so hmm. this yeah that's what i would do i forgot about the pool table it's taken up mm. a giant footprint right in front of my garage door if you can get it in the house it's a great place to fold clothes and, ba- and blankets <laughs> oh yeah, and so I do. I'm doing all my leather work on top of it right now. Okay, mm. that's where I'm bending up. I, even on my Instagram story last night, I showed the progress of the next 15 bags I'm making, and it's all right on top of the pool table. It's a good video though. It's closing yeah. in on 400 thousand views, so it's nice. It's big for me. I think um, so. Those tools that I mentioned earlier, I would definitely get rid of. <clears throat> But I, I wonder if, like realistically, if I should look at 
eventually getting rid of some of the metalworking tools and just keeping like the basic, like a welder and, you know, grinders and stuff. But as much as I wanted to use the bridge port, and I have used it a few times, it's a very large thing to just not use. And the same for the lathe. Wait till you see like my chain are... making video, then you're going to want to keep it. You're going to be like, I'm going to make a chain one day. I, why would I make a chain? That's the, <laughs> that, that's the like, question Jimmy so far had, from what and, you were doing. And he sees, yeah. he, he realized he didn't need it. You don't have to have a, a why. Yeah. 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 I think if I had, you know, endless space, like Jimmy, if I had like eight shops and <clears throat> I just could accumulate tools and keep them for that one situation where I would use them, that would be ideal, obviously. I would love to keep all of the tools so that eventually I was able to potentially make anything that I wanted out of right. any material with any process. That's like long-term goal. But the reality is, you know, I don't live in a place to where I can like, and this isn't a jab at you. Like I wish that I lived in a place where I could, I, I want to build a building that's just for metalworking and focus this area on this thing. I live in a neighborhood. I have mm -hmm. a large space, but it's still limited space. And so I have to be choosy about, what's going to be the long term you know what's going to take up the footprint long term and i think you were talking about like spending money jimmy and you were getting used to that i think i went through the same thing with getting used to having space mm -hmm. getting used to having a big shop and i'm like oh yeah i can take that tool oh yeah i can buy one of those i can whatever and now i'm just uh, you know half the shop is where i mostly shoot so i try to keep it reasonably in shape and usable and stuff and then the other whole side is i don't know what to do with this like it's right there it's huge it's heavy and it's right there you know yeah and i, I, I think sooner than later there's going to be kind of a reckoning with me in space and i'm going to have to start you yeah. know like legitimately get letting go of some stuff that that ultimately like you know like i can find another way to join a board i can find another somebody that has a lathe but I, don't, I can't even remember the last time I personally was like, you know what? I, I would really like to use my lathe. Yeah. No, I, tr I tried it. I learned it. I got okay enough at it to do a thing. And I haven't had an interest since then. So I should probably just pass it on to somebody and, like, you know, free that footprint. But there is, a, there is an advantage of having limited space. And you, you don't think about it when you want more space to put stuff. But it helps you focus on what you do. Like, I don't have a full metal shop. I just got some basic tools. That's good enough because I can do some. Yeah. I I can do some crazy stuff, and I can focus more on the woodworking and then use the metal stuff as as accents. Having too many options is paralyzing. Yeah. And I, I want to jump out of that and clarify something real quick because I know this will somebody will think this and they'll think, yeah, Bob, but you talk about not having space, but you have an office building that only has one person in it. You have a farm barn, which has a dead car in it. So you have space and you are correct. I do have space. I have space that I could put those things in those places. The thing about me is that I, I know that I've learned that if those things are not right here at my fingertips, then they, get I ignored. Will, mm -hmm. they will get ignored and I will not make the effort to go use them. If that's the way, you know, with the Gia, it's out at the farm and it has its necessary tools there. So if I'm there, I have what I need. But I've thought several times about, well, what if I moved all of the metalworking stuff out there so it's all in one place? And that would be cool, except that if I'm working on a woodworking project here and I need a metal bracket, I'm not going to drive yeah. all the way over there just to fabricate a bracket. when I c It, it could have been right here. you know. It's the scissor so, lift that's yes, not charged. I do have space. I, I don't, do I? <laughs> it's the scissor lift that's <laughs> not charged. If there's a barrier... Sure. You're not going to use it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to figure out how to change either that mentality for me so that I can take advantage of more advantage of the space that I have or just cut those tools out of the equation completely. They don't have, I don't have, to, I don't make brackets. I buy brackets, you know, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. the thing is. Um, like make the decision. I don't have to turn my own leg for this table that I'm going to make some year you know, in the future, I can buy a leg and not have a lathe taking up floor print for 10 years. So 
I just need to work on that for myself. But mm-hmm. what's one thing that you would never uh, table saw aside? What's one thing that you would never get rid of? I know Jimmy's, but um, can I? I like to really. Um, I'd like to combine two tools into one: the laser and the CNC. Oh. Like mm. I enjoy using them so much, and it's so satisfying when something comes out. Especially like the lasers. The laser is pretty easy to use. The CNC, I still have. I still have stumbling blocks of figuring out clamping or tool paths or whatever. But when it comes out, I'm like, man, this is so cool. And now I, I got this figured out. I can just make another one quickly. Um, I think those are the digital tools are just so fun. They really are. We've come such a long mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Even I mean, talking about even on this podcast in the beginning, I remember being like, "I think one of my goals is I'm going to get a laser one day soon." <laughs> and now you've had four now of I them, have, or five of them. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I've, I've had at least four of yeah. them exactly. I got two giant ones right now that both work fairly well. Yeah. I could pretty much do anything I want. But is there one thing that I would never get rid of? Obviously, a bandsaw. By the way, yeah, my giant I mean. bandsaw <laughs> is done. If uh, that's going to be my recommendation today, if anybody uh, oh. check out check out uh, Keith Rucker, he's making a giant bandsaw for me. I know this latest video is out; I haven't seen it yet. But the video, the bandsaw is done, and uh, I'll go back try and tell the story really fast. A couple of years ago, these giant bandsaws were getting scrapped, and Keith went online and said, "Anybody want these bandsaws?" And I said, "Yes, I'll buy them." Oh, they've already sold. Up, oh, they're available. Up, oh, they're sold. Up. Oh, and then they came to me. They were available. And they're giant. If both of them were working properly, they have a four-foot wheel on them. So if you think about like a Delta bandsaw, is the 14-inch ones. This one has a 48-inch wheel. So that makes the throat of the bandsaw 48 inches or about 40, 47 inches. Wow. They used to be, they were made to create, they were in a caboose factory in Georgia. Caboose factory, and so between the two of them, one of the, well, they were missing a lot of parts. The two of them together made one big one. And Keith wrote me a message. He's like, "Look, I'll go pick them up for you, and I'll store them in my property until you can figure out how to get them out of here." He, and then he wrote to me, and he goes, "I have an idea. Let me restore one of them, and I get all the the video credits and such and such, and then you get a cool restored bandsaw." And I said, "Deal." And he's been working on it for a few years, and the final video's out. Wow! So that I will never get rid of. I said, "I can't wait to free sculpt on this giant band. It's like a sawmill bandsaw, basically." So that, um, I, I, you know, I think about time to time, like my plasma cutter. It's it, it it is such an incredible machine when it's working well, and and you have like a good design that cuts well. The plasma cutter is just insane. I have a Lincoln Electric Torchmate table. And uh, four by four, it's a little it's a little finicky. They're always finicky to work with, and they're messy and they're sloppy, and they create sparks. And I, I clean the machine off all the time, and then I look at it, and it's just covered with black muck. But that is, is such an incredible thing to have. Uh, what else would I never get rid of? My welding table, my giant welding table that I got from Strong Hand Tools is such an incredible upgrade when i first started working on youtube and i i I wasn't very i wasn't very weldery when i first started working on youtube i got into weldering (laughs) when (laughs) when uh craig from lincoln electric who pat he doesn't work there anymore but craig reached out to me and and because of craig i got into welding much much deeper and when i first started welding i was welding on a piece of scrap steel that was three eighths inch thick, had an angle cut into one side. It was just a piece of scrap I bought at the scrapyard. And that was my welding table. That piece of metal is still kicking around somewhere. And that was my, on top of a wooden table. And that was my welding table. And when I look back and I think, wow, we've come a long way, baby. Um, yeah. What else wouldn't I get rid of? Every- I'm keeping everything. I'm keeping yeah. everything. I'm keeping everything. <laughs> Jimmy just builds another building and puts it there yeah i don't know i'll keep everything yeah i think a, a lot about you're talking about the plasma table i have a plasma table as well that i've used one time and i have plans for it i want to use it <clears throat> it just has not worked its way into kind of my schedule yet but one of the reasons that even though i don't have a 
I don't have a history with it. I don't have a use case that it's like, a, you know, obviously I should have a plasma table. I, I do see it as a potential for manufacturing. Small scale, I've got an idea for a thing that I could sell that people with this car could put on this thing to make it whatever, you know. And same for 3D printers. Like I don't, I don't have a hard time finding a justification to have several 3D printers because if I decide I want to make a whole bunch of something, which I actually have a couple of ideas now that I want to produce, I need those printers to do it. Same for the CNC, same for the laser. It, it, those are all digital tools, um, but for manufacturing, even small scale, it makes a lot of sense for them to be able to justify their floor space. Something like a lathe, in my case, I don't make pens, I don't make things to sell with a lathe, that's harder to justify. A joiner is harder to justify. And so I think I'm going down that same path where the stuff that could theor theoretically be a production machine for something, especially if I don't have to run the machine manually, like it's pretty easy to justify those things taking up space, you know, um, because I'm like we've talked about many, 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 many times, I'm still looking for a way to be able to produce stuff to sell outside of the content, in addition to the content, you know. And I think those machines all have that potential, at least. So, um, I just sent you guys a picture of that giant yeah. printer. Yeah. Isn't that ridiculous? It, you can make it's like one a of smart those car. New, you can make one of those new basketballs. That's what this person looks oh, like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that is huge. I see you could step in it. Wow. Yeah, you can you can get in it. We can use it as a storm shelter. So <laughs> I can make some like steel panels to go yeah. on the side of it, put it in the shop, and then when there's a tornado coming through, I'm like, all right, everybody, hop in the printer. We can get in there. <laughs> oh, that'd be pretty funny. Anyway, uh, this you is guys the got actual anything else one. On this that, is the actual yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, because from Elago, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, no, that's it. I keep everything. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to thank our Patreon supporters. And you guys can come up with something to recommend, <clears throat> as usual. Big thanks to everybody over at Patreon that supports us. We say it every week because we are legitimately grateful for the support. Everybody over there gets the after show, which is like a little bit, you know, another show, separate feed. After this, we usually talk about extra stuff, secret stuff. I'm going to tell you about the White Land Cruiser, the player piano, at least today. Maybe talk about my storage idea, see if you guys have any ideas for that. Um, and that's all, you know, through Patreon only. So if you want to get that after show, get a little bit more of us every week, you can go to patreon.com slash making it and join up at any level. So everybody over there gets it. But we have a group of top supporters that are like, They've been around for a long time. They help us out more than they need to, but we're very grateful for them. That's Nick Ryan, Corey Ward, Albers Woodworks, Works by Solo, Chad from Mancrafting, Chad's Custom Creations, Rich at Low and Design, Odin Leathergood, Sean Beckner, Scott at Dad It Yourself, G D Dad It Yourself DIY. I almost jammed that together with Jeff at the New Janky Workshop, who I talked to last night on a call, and um, Warren Works, Michael Manegin, and Crabtree Creative. Big thanks to them for going above and beyond. It it does mean a lot. Um, we would really appreciate the support if you want to go over there and check it out. So, what do you guys have to recommend? Jimmy, you already said yours. Yeah, Keith Rucker. Yeah, I just sent you cool. guys the video. So, cool. Uh, this is a video. It's called I Made a Chill Space Roving Robo Gold Goldfish. And it's just this <laughs> tiny little... Do you see wow. it, Bob? No, it's an interesting title. Oh, it's an interesting title. Uh, it, it's not a it's not a very uh, YouTube algorithm friendly title, but the video has done really well because the video is so good. Um, this guy's he's just making this little sculpture, this little goldfish sculpture, and it's got some Robo armor on there, and it's not something I would normally watch but i just came across it and then i was just blown away by all the techniques that he he uses to make this little sculpture it's just it's fantastic hmm. i always feel like i gotta sell my 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 pick of the week like it's so fantastic you gotta watch it it's so cool there's so many things you're gonna learn um 
you don't need, I, I don't I don't need to sell it. It sells itself. Yeah. It's a recommendation. <laughs> it's a recommendation. They do with it as yeah. they please. It is really good though. I mean, my recommendation is one that maybe two other people are going to want to look up, but hey, it was helpful. So there's a channel that's been around for a long time called Project Wrong Way and I don't know if I've talked about him before, um, but he started rebuilding a, a Land Cruiser, an FJ40, several years ago, and I don't really think he had it. I haven't watched them all, but I don't think he knew what he was doing. I think he just started get, doing what I'm doing. He's just, like, digging into it. He's completely rebuilt this thing now and is actually working on other vehicles and stuff. But it's a lot of, like, real person trying to figure out how to fix a car and rebuild a car and, you know, doing it the wrong way, <laughs> doing it the right way. And so I've seen several videos from him over the years. I've learned a lot of stuff about how to fix certain things or how to replace certain things because it's a great resource for that. Um, and I used one of his videos for the clutch replacement that I did the other day. So I wanted to, like, throw it out there. It's He's fun to watch, too. He's a funny guy. So it's called Project Wrong Way. Um, it's a great keep channel Keep it in name. your back pocket in case you ever need, um, you know, to fix something. Man, i got to type this whole title. I made a chill space roving robo goldfish. That's only, that's only the that first half crazy. of the title. It goes on. Wow. Nuts. All right, cool. Well, um, you guys got anything else for this week? Mm, no. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, oh, Brian Prusa. Oh, yeah. Oh, happy birthday, buddy. <laughs>